Oh my goodness, everyone. Today, you are truly going to hear a heroic story about how, number one, your life can change in a second, but most importantly, how you can thrive through anything. Today's guest is Francesco Clark, and he is the owner of Clark's Botanicals, but his story of perseverance is so powerful, and I just want you to sit back, relax, and get ready to be ultimately inspired. Somebody say it again. No, no, no. What's up? He's better than Oprah. Come on, y'all. This is Sean T, and it's time to trust and believe. I want to jump right in because the listeners of Trust and Believe, they love um, just success stories. And more importantly, they love just the internal success story of people having to dig deep because a lot of people, as you know, they wake up every single day and they're unable to find that strength to move forward with whatever's happening in their life. So while I want to cover so much, I kind of want to start with the day, if it's okay, the day you dove into the pool, because I think that's just, you know, kind of a defining moment for people to hear about. Yeah. And we all have, you know, days like that. Um, as we live our lives, there are these days that as, as they're unfolding, <clears throat> we know that we're going to remember them for the rest of our lives. And they um, start to define our um, path forward. So I was working, um, I was 24 years old, working at Conan Ast magazines and then um, went over to Hearst magazines. And I was working in the fashion department at Harper's Bazaar. And I was um, an assistant in the editorial department, and I was living my perfect life. Um, I was assisting with shoots that Madonna Stylist was working on, that um, going to all the New York Fashion Week shows, understanding what it means to have um, a vision of something and make it come true. And I was there for a year and made a lot of friends, um, was promoted, And the day that I was promoted, um, it was Memorial Day weekend. So that Friday, I went out to um, Long Island, to the Hamptons, to um, celebrate. But also, I had a summer share house. And it was with friends of friends of friends. So complete strangers, pretty much. And it was the perfect uh, June 1st day. It was 75 degrees, not a cloud in the sky. Um... I was, I felt unstoppable. I felt um, incredible. And, you know, typical 24-year-old, you just feel like you're the king of the world um, (laughs) at that age. Um, And I get to the house and I'm I'm there for no more than um, a couple of hours. Um, And the metal ring ladder that's normally in the deep end of the pool, um, for some reason, was in the shallow end of the pool, I would later find out. Um, And I dove into this pool, just going for a swim because it was a beautiful day. And the second that I dove in, I learned that that was the shallow end of the pool because my chin hit the bottom of the pool floor with such force that it snapped my neck back and it shattered my C3, C4 vertebrae, which is two inches above that little bump in the back of your neck. Immediately, I was underwater. My arms were splayed to the side. I was floating, and I could see the little air bubbles float up from my mouth. Um, But I was completely awake. Um, And I knew exactly what happened. It's one of those instinctive um, moments where I could feel the swelling in my spine. I could not feel below my neck. And it felt like two metal rods just hit each other with such a like, loud clash that it reverberated throughout my body. Um, and the first thing that I thought um, was, wow, I'm an idiot. I can't believe I just dove into the shallow end of a pool. I've 
gone swimming my entire life. Um, and then I heard um, my mother's voice kind of come over me and say, um, you have to get better. And um, luckily, somebody walked in um, to the pool area because I was completely alone and lifted my head above the water. And I said, call 911, you just saved my life. But they didn't believe that anything was wrong because I didn't have a scratch anywhere. I didn't have any, there was no blood, there was no bruise. I looked the same as I did 30 seconds before. Um, and so I said, no, I just, I broke my neck, I'm paralyzed. You have to call 911 and I have to be helicoptered over to um, the emergency room. And so then I started directing people into what to do because at that point, fight or flight took over. And for me in that instance, fight took over. And I didn't have um, the luxury of being able to panic. Instead, I had only the capacity to direct people into what to do. And that was part of a coping mechanism of how I could stay calm. Mm -hmm. And so I was telling people to stabilize my neck lift me out of the pool. Um, I was telling everybody where my parents were on vacation. They were in Florida for the weekend. Um, and then I was helicoptered over to SUNY Stony Brook in Long Island. And the surgeon comes over to me and said that I had less than a 19% chance of surviving not only that night, but the next two years of my life, even if I were to survive the surgery to stabilize my spine. And that was, it felt like one of those moments when I was looking up at the sky after I was lifted up out of the pool where to me at that point, life felt unfair because it was such a beautiful day. It was such a calm, perfect, serene day and everything was going right. And then suddenly my lungs were collapsing, my vocal cords were failing and I was told I was going to be dying. Mm. And it didn't make sense um, in my mind. Uh, first and foremost, thank you so much for sharing that because I know reliving those experiences can always be tough, but clearly you've done a lot of introspective and self-reflection since that time. And just hearing you talk about it, I'm able to be able to tell that just from my own <laughs> past experiences so i just want to thank you because i know how tough you know telling and reliving those stories can be um after that happened what was you know i know you heard your your mother's voice which i think is incredibly powerful and i don't want to skip over that because i just believe that we have angels in the world that are Number one with us now, and they are with us in time of great need in moments like that. So in addition to hearing your mother's voice, what was the next thing you thought of when you got out of the surgery and you're now in the hospital? You know, what what was the kind of process that you went through to kind of start to climb, you know, climb the hill, if you will? Absolutely. I. It was very apparent to me when I woke up from surgery how alone I felt up until that point. So those 18 hours of me being wheeled into, and then the final scene was like wheeling into this um, operating room where everything was awash in these light green mint tiles and this medical equipment hovering over my body. And I felt completely alone. And when I woke up from surgery, I didn't feel alone because my parents and my sister were suddenly by my side. And the doctor was telling my father the same thing that he had said to me. He said, forget about him using his legs. Forget about him using his arms. He's not going to be able to breathe on his own. And he's not going to be able to speak. And my father, he didn't know that my father is a medical doctor. And my father turned to him and he said, I hope you don't speak to your other patients like this. And then my mom looks at me and she said, Sposta qualcosa, move something in mm. Italian. Mm. And so then I twitched my shoulder and she looks back at the surgeon and she said, you don't know Francesco. 
And it was the first moment where I felt like, of course, I'm going to get better. Because if I have such strong people that believe in me and support me, of course, I'm going to get better. Of course, I'm going to figure out a way um, to get up that hill um, and to find a solution. And so every day I used, I'm very much a dreamer and Mm. every day was about um, finding creative outlets. Um, Even when I was on life support for two weeks, um, I was intubated. And when they were telling my parents that they were going to try to take the tube out, they said, he's probably not going to survive but we're not going to know unless you, we take the tube out of his mouth from his lungs. And they said, no, um, you know, he would want to take this risk. And luckily my diaphragm started working and I started to breathe again. But then I had to do these most, the most boring exercises to regain capacity of your lungs. Um, and this, therapist came into my room with this little tube that was attached to a cup with a red ball in it. And I had to blow it for like two hours a day. And I did that maybe for 10 minutes. And I said, this is not fun. No one is going to do this for two and a half hours a day. (laughs) And so my sister and my best friend brought in um, speakers and they started playing the best of ABBA. And I started singing really bad karaoke in the ICU. My lung capacity went back to normal. Um, but it was really about doing stupid things like that, but still, still, you know, doing the work, but making it fun and being more lighthearted, Mm -hmm. um, and not having it be so, so heavy all the time. First of all, um, when you said you were singing ABBA, but then you said you weren't a good karaoke singer, I'm like, okay, because I was, I was definitely going to ask you to sing a little no. bit. No, no. Um, yeah. That is, that's, it's incredible. So you're in your hospital bed, and you are go, and I know physical therapy. I mean, I went through physical therapy in my hand once. I had a, like wrist surgery, and I know what you mean. It's like squeeze this ball, and you're like really, can I just like go act like I'm going to do a push up or something, (laughs) you know, just something, uh, but it does work in a way. Um, so you're in your hospital bed and you're like, I have to do something, you know? So when did this, I, this incredibly amazing idea come up where you're like, I have to, what seems like I have to build something. I have to create something. I want to, you know, do something that's fun because obviously you love having fun and then two you're like i need to make some money i never started clark's botanical skincare as an idea of a business i wanted to start it actually became a thing because i was dealing with a deep dark depression i was dealing with the trauma of um suddenly becoming um paralyzed and not feeling 99 percent of my body And bigger than that, I was also dealing with the trauma of a near-death experience. And what I learned was survivor's guilt, Mm. uh, where technically you're supposed to, you should have passed away. You should have died, but you survive. And what happened with me in that experience is that then you want you feel bad that other people went through that experience with you because there is this collective feeling of um, grief where you almost could have. And that shock of what happened goes hand in hand with your family, go through it and your very close friends go through it too. Mm -hmm. And so all I wanted to do was to make it better for them. Um, And then when I survived, I felt like, wow, I have another shot at life. And am I good enough to to have this second chance? And what am I going to do with the rest of my life to show them? Because they've showed me how much they love me by caring for me and sleeping by my side and um, 
being there for me in my most difficult moments, but how would I be a good enough person to show them that I deserved that? And the day that Christopher Reeve passed away, suddenly I realized that I had been um, relying on Superman Mm. to be my advocate. And suddenly he was gone and nobody knew why. There was no reason why in the beginning. There was no explanation. And it kind of made you realize that life is very fleeting. And I was in the car on the way to the rehab hospital to do physical therapy. And when I got to do therapy, I, I was thinking, well, you know, what about what I should be doing for myself? And what about me taking responsibility for what happened to my life and me becoming my own advocate? And you shouldn't rely on somebody else to be your hero necessarily. You can be your own hero. And I had been asked um, to be part of an advocacy group for New York State for people with disabilities. And I kept saying no, because I never wanted to leave the house and see other people. And the reason why is that I felt like the only thing that people wanted to talk about was why I was in my wheelchair. Mm. That wasn't true. You know, nobody really came up to me and asked me that every day. It was just what I thought that they would, that they were thinking. And so when I came back home that day, I said, you know what? I'm going to go to that meeting. It's tomorrow. It was the next day. And I said, but mom, I have to put on a real shirt and real pants because I had been wearing the same um, T-shirt every day from the hospital and the same blue paper hospital pants every day. I would shave my head bald every week. And I didn't look in a mirror um, for three years. And I couldn't be in a room with a lot of um, windows because all I would see was a reflection of the wheelchair and I would start crying. Mm. But that day I looked in the mirror And I I had to come face to face with um, what the spinal cord injury did to my skin. And so because my skin was affected by my injury, my skin doesn't react to temperature anymore. It still doesn't now. Um, I could be in a room that's 105 degrees and just my skin will not sweat. And because of that, my skin lost its ability to rebalance itself. And when I looked in the mirror... Um, my skin looked 10 years older than it was because it couldn't release toxins. It was oily in certain areas, dry and flaky, red, but gray in other areas. Um, By this point, I felt happy. I felt strong. I did not look happy. I did not look strong. I wanted to be able to reconnect with other people. And I wanted for them to want to connect with me as well. And so we tend to think about the way that we look as something that can be very shallow, but the first sign of depression is you not caring about your appearance Mm -hmm. and not caring um, about, you know, bathing and things like that. And that's because it's an easy way to shut you out from other people and to disconnect from other people. But I was experiencing the opposite because I was getting better from being depressed. And so I actually wanted to look better because I felt better. And so I started to care about the way that I looked more because the inside of me had gotten to that psychological and emotional state where I was strong. And so I tried prescription creams, $3 creams, $300 dollar creams, nothing worked. My father's a medical doctor and a homeopathic doctor as well. Um, And I said, you have to help me because I don't look good. Um, And so we started mixing products in the kitchen. It was just like um, kind of an experiment that we started on me. (laughs) (laughs) Did Did he try the experiment as well? Yeah, I mean, so it took us five years because we started looking at um, botanical extracts and vitamins um, and ways that you can mix um, extracts um, to make your skin become its healthiest that it can be. My skin looked worse when we started. We went through 78 different versions. 
until we found what is today the Jasmine Catalyst Complex, which is in all of our products. Um, you know, and then after about four and a half years, um, five years, we discovered this mixture that started to make my skin look better. But again, I was doing this like before I went to physical therapy and when I got home and I would do research with my father and my mom, my mother as well. But then when my skin started to look better, I had these 12 vials on my desk. And one day I get to my desk and I'm like, there are only nine vials now. And my sister comes up to me and she's like, yeah, I stole three <laughs> because I noticed that your skin looked better. And then my mom, um, my mom started stealing them too. So I started this pyramid scheme of kleptomaniacs <laughs> um, a product. Yeah. And then my former boss um, was at Harper's Bazaar and she said, if you're using it, I'm going to use it. And then she noticed that her skin started to look better and then they wanted to shoot it in the magazine. And that's when it became a company because then I had a very parallel feeling to when I was in the ICU bed and my family was by my side, suddenly my former boss from Harper's Bazaar believed in me so much to include it in the magazine that, of course, Clark's Botanicals would become a company and would become successful because it had so much support from people that wanted it to do well. And that's the way that I look at um, our customers now. Um, they are, our customers are our lifeblood and I, the connection with other people because of skincare um, has rebuilt my life. And so it's been a huge experience for me um, and life changing. There's so many people who are successful and then something happens and then they, you know, they kind of lose it. Right. And then their second bout of success is almost lacking something, but it seems like you enhanced whatever you were doing already. And so that's why I'm like, what are those three things that you did every day to, to bring you back to this place? So being successful at work was, is not very different from the way that I look at life in general. And I think that before I had my spinal cord injury, I think I had different buckets in my mind of this is what I have to do at work to be successful, which is not necessarily the same kinds of things that I have to do to be successful at life. Um, but after I had my spinal cord injury, I realized that I had to be present and committed to my life and my life included work. Um, so things that I decided to start to do, I would do wholeheartedly. And a lot of that had to do with the fact that no one else is going to do it for you. And a lot of those missed opportunities of what could have been as I was laying on the operating table made me realize, well, what about when I start to get better? Then I don't want to live that what could have been life. I want to experience it. And so for me, it was, I never thought about starting a company, but when I did, why didn't I, why didn't I have the right to that? And why didn't I have the right to think about recovering from a spinal cord injury, even if it meant taking a long time? Why don't you have the right to hope for that? And so one of the three things that I did is visualize. I started to really think about active visualization and for me that meant self-guided meditations that I would do at night um, in the beginning I did it with um, a therapist and then every night and I, I do it now it's just what I do automatically as I go to sleep I think about you know where do I want to be what do I want to do and then you start to see the dream of what you want to make you happy and I started to build upon this kind of fuzzy idea of what I wanted and thinking about it every day meant that I could add detail, more and more detail to it. And it got so detailed to the point that it started to become true because 
we were making these things in the kitchen. And then my former boss, when it included in a magazine, great, but that wasn't enough for me. And then I started thinking, well, what if we wanted this to be something that would give back to medical research and help other people realize that they can be their own heroes and be their own inspirations? And so then I called the Christopher Reeve Foundation and met with them. And then we started to give a portion of proceeds to the Reeve Foundation. And then the Reeve Foundation asked me to become one of their ambassadors, which was like the whole reason why I came out of this depression was because of Superman. And so it became this um, realization of a dream. But in order to realize it, it took a lot of work. Mm. I didn't just say like, oh, I'm just going to put it out into the universe um, and expect for it to happen. It meant actively thinking about what I wanted to make me happy and then materialize it in the right kind of way. The other thing that I did, which this, this problem, this one sounds um, very easy to do um, was I got a really big dry erase board um, that was like the size of a desk and I put it up on the wall and I put the days of the week on the dry erase board on the, every week I pick an inspirational quote that's sometimes a little bit funny, but it's still inspirational. And then I started to write down what I would do for a workout every day. And the reason why that started to help my life is that it doesn't necessarily show you when you're always doing a good job, but it shows you when you skip a day (laughs) and it starts to show you like, Oh, I didn't do, I have this bike that I pedal laying down with my arms and my legs And I have a machine that I stand um, and I work out and I lift weights every day. Um, You start to realize, oh, I skipped aerobic activity three days in a row. I can't do that anymore. And so then I also started to write down little notes in addition to my workout, like, um, you know, went for this big meeting in the city, whatever. Um, But it made me start to build upon... Um, having a structure in my day because suddenly I was not in a New York City office anymore. I was in my parents' um, house and I couldn't move my fingers and I couldn't, at the time I couldn't move my arms, but like what could I do to regain a sense of normalcy and control and schedule? And that was a huge um, little thing that I could do that really changed my life. The third thing that um, really helped me was realize that there's no sense of pride in not asking for help. Mm. There's no sense of pride in staying quiet when um, you need other people's experience um, to guide you through something. And so I emailed and I would call everybody. I... I mean, I I emailed Anna Wintour um, a couple yes. of times about questions, and she replied. Yes. And, and I emailed um, the president of Estee Lauder, you know, John Dempsey, and then he replied. And then it became this sense of the world didn't have to be, um, like, a fearful, antagonistic place that was full of negativity, it actually became the world can be the opposite where you can just let the right people in more um, and letting them in meant me reaching out. Um, And it became like this little snowflake that started to roll down a hill that became a snowball. And um, it just became something that when you, when you think about it, um, that's how you build a family. That's how you build your network of friends. And that's how you build a support system. Um, But it really did start from this very, very scary, lonely place of feeling like I had nothing except for the way that I could think. Mm. And changing the way that I thought is the only thing that I could do. Um, in order to say, you know what, if the doctor was wrong about me, 
obviously I can talk. I don't shut up. You know, he said I wouldn't be able to talk. He said I wouldn't be able to breathe or move my arms and I'm doing that. So if he was wrong about those things, then what else could he be wrong about? And what else could I do that was a little bit more? Um, and so it just kind of built upon itself. I think there are so many great foundational tools that you're always able to build upon. Like, uh, I mean, meditation, you know, you started with the way you think and meditation is obviously you talked about visualization and I love what you said about, um, something like you didn't want to dream those days. You wanted to live those days. And I love how like turning your dreams into reality. And then I love how, you keep track of not just the days that you're consistent, but of the days that you consistently miss. You know, because some people miss one day and they're like, oh, I miss another day. And then they lose track. But how, let's let's keep a calendar of how many days you missed so we can shorten that. That's great. And then last but not least, knowing how to build a support system in a family, but most importantly, not being afraid or too proud. You know, there was that song a while ago. I ain't too proud to beg. Not that you were begging, but, you know, just being not being afraid to reach out and ask for help. All right. I want to get into the skincare line because I'm telling you right now, this face at 40, um, I'll be 43 in a couple of weeks. You know what I mean? I want to get this right. So you have to help me out. Tell me all about it. I'm like, I'm here. Like you, I'm looking at you. For those of you who are watching YouTube, you see what I'm seeing. For those of you who are listening to this on your podcast app, you need to go to YouTube and see Francesco because his face is lit and beat down. So, all right, give me, give me all the, the details of the product. Absolutely. So we don't have that many products in the Clark's Botanicals lineup. And the reason why is our smoothing marine cream, for example, it was the first product that I created with my father. It's a serum and a moisturizer in one. So it's $105 for the bigger jar. It's $75 for the smaller jar. It's expensive. But the reason why it's that price is because of the active ingredients that we use in there. And it better work if you're going to spend that much money. Exactly. And so everything about what Clark's Botanicals does is about using less product and not needing five products to get ready in the day. And it's really about that mirror moment. And I don't know if, if you feel this way, but um, what I've started to notice and in speaking with a lot of our customers, when now that we've been experiencing quarantine and lockdown in different um, times of the year, you're home all the time, but you're, as soon as the bathroom door opens after you take a shower, you're expected to be available all the time. And it's kind of ironic because you're not seeing anybody, but you're expected to be available. All the time. <laughs> yeah. And so it creates for an environment that you have less self care. And after I take a shower, you have those five to 10 minutes in front of the mirror as you're thinking about what you want to get done for the day. And then you think about like, okay, but how do I want to do it? I want to be really good at, you know, this presentation and that phone call and, you know, this meeting with this other person. And as you're doing that, like I'm applying skincare, um, it becomes a very therapeutic exercise during my day because it's one of the only moments that I'm truly alone and pepping myself up and kind of psyching myself up. Yeah. And what I like about Clark's Botanicals and our intention in making the products is to show you that you actually can achieve those things. Um, and our skincare is going to be an overachiever with what it says it's going to do. So when you're putting the smoothing marine cream on, you're going to feel the 5% glycolic acid tingle on your skin. You're going to, you're going to see the glucosamine HCL, um, which is one of the strongest antioxidants start to work on your skin. And it's going, to, it's going to start making your skin glow from the inside out. And so when that starts to happen, you start to think, oh, I actually can be that hero version of what I was imagining um, as I was getting ready. And that person is not 
this like cartoon version of myself. It's me. It's just you. You know, it's, it's, it's a better version of yourself. And what I really like about skincare is that it's not, it doesn't cover anything up. It's not like makeup or concealer. It doesn't mm. cover, it doesn't hide. It's completely transparent. It's completely you. Um, and you, you know, my goal is to have no more than three products for, for you to get better and for you to look good. Um, and one jar lasts three months. So it lasts a lot longer than a typical product. All of our products are immunostimulating. Our um, Retinol Rescue Overnight Cream, for example, won the Oprah Winfrey Award for Beauty because we use time-release retinol and we couple it with time-release vitamin C and then we um, synergize that with colloidal oatmeal. So you're using an ingredient like retinol, um, which helps to increase cell turnover in your skin, showing off you know, newer skin, less wrinkles, even out um, uneven tone in your skin. But you're also calming the skin down and nourishing it with colloidal oatmeal. So a lot of the prescription retinol products that you might have tried will work incredibly well, but you'll get red after using them for two to three days. And so then you stop using them for four days. Instead, what we did is we use a much more gentle retinol coupled with vitamin C and colloidal that is not as strong, but it becomes more effective because you're using it again, more consistent, mm. more consistently. So it's kind of like, do you want to go to the gym three days a month and expect results? Or would you go 30 days in a month and then actually see results? Um, and that's the way that we really look at all the ingredients that we use and we're, we are, in a category that's called a clean. And what that means is that we don't use any ingredients that would be questionably harmful for your body or your skin. So it's using the best of nature and the best of science. And it becomes like a clinical clean product. Um, so we are 95% natural, but we do use scientific ingredients when it benefits the skin and it makes you look better, as long as they're not at all questionable um, for your skin. After after I start using it, how long will I start? How long until I start to see results? You know, you're not going to get six pack abs in one day. Mm-hmm. You're not going to get um, huge biceps and huge shoulders in one day. I couldn't use my arms for months. I had to think about doing therapy, like moving them a quarter of an inch. And now I can lift weights with them, um, but it takes time to do because you're changing your body's, you're changing the muscles in your body. And when you're using skincare and you're using something that has active ingredients, that's boosting collagen production, for example, um, and decreasing sebum, you know, if you're looking at acne or if you're looking at wrinkles, it takes at least three weeks um, after consistent use. Um, so using a little bit every day and in about three weeks, you start to notice results. And what's really cool about, um, the parallels between working out and skincare Mm -hmm. is that you might not notice it for three weeks, but your friends will notice it. Yes. And other people will be like, Oh, your posture's better. Um, you look more confident when you're sitting or when you're standing, or when you're walking. And it's because you've been consistent with your workout. With skincare, people will just say, like, you look happier. You look, um, I don't know, there's something that you look a lot better, but I can't put my finger on it. And then they start to notice that your your skin looks better or you look more rested. Yes. Um, but it's all about consistency. Um, it's also, and you, you know, you you speak to this also. It's about treating yourself with respect and how often do you want to treat yourself with respect? I mean, you want to do that all the time and you really want to be consistent with that because it's your body and it's Mm -hmm. your life. And like, if you want to, if you want to be the best version of yourself, you have to treat yourself that way too. So it's about self-respect. 
Francesco, I usually ask people to define trust and believe, but you are a true testimony of trust and belief and not just what you went through in terms of the accident and getting healthier. I mean, prior to and post and even today, I mean, you are the Shanti of skincare and I am the, hey, and good. I, and I'm the Francesco of, uh, <laughs> of fitness. That's what I'll say. But I just want to tell people right now to number one, I want them to check you out, but most importantly, I'm, I want them to go to Clark's botanicals.com right now. Let's do our before and after photo or before in progress photos, because yes. I think, um, I am definitely getting this product. I'm going to use it and I have to reach out to you and show you my, my three week progress and beyond. Cause I tell people don't stop when you start to see results. When you start to see results is when you should find sustainability. Do you have any final words for our listeners? I, I am so honored um, to have been able to have connect with you, Sean, and um, just to have anybody care to listen because um, I'm such a big fan of what you do to help transform other people's lives um, with working out um, and it's not just working out there's so much more to it than that that um, it's really about inner strength um, not just physical strength you start to really um it's almost like you're 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 not just working out your muscles, you're strengthening your DNA and your mm. sense of self. And so I'm just very honored to be able to speak with you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much. And everyone, make sure you always trust and believe in who you are, like Francesco did. <laughs>